Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our Reed and Christine Halliday executive lecture today. Uh, as Dr. Seeley said, we, this is the last lecture of this semester, and I want you to know we saved the best for last here. So today our speaker is Paul Magleby. He's the founder of Magleby Construction, which is Utah's premier custom home builder and construction company. Magleby started the company in 74, the same year he graduated from BYU with a degree in construction management. Today, Magleby Companies employs more than 80 individuals and specializes in custom homes, remodels, commercial projects, cabinetry, artisan doors, rough and finished carpentry, home maintenance, upkeep, and excavation. Paul Magleby has built his business almost entirely through client referrals, evidence of the satisfaction homeowners have to this unique building process and its final results. The company has a reputation for producing homes, remodels, and commercial projects of unparalleled quality and beauty. Malagby was named the first National Custom Home Builder of the Year by the National Association of Home Builders in 2007. The award was based not only on the excellence of his company's products, but also on Magleby's many contributions to the home builder industry and the community at large. In addition to being named National Builder of the Year in 2007, Paul was named the Builder of the Year for a second time in the local Utah Valley Home Building Association in 2008. The Magleby Remodel Group was formally started six years ago in response to the growing trend in the industry to remodel instead of building new homes. Magleby currently has over 15 employees who spend all of their time doing, well, doing remodel work ranging from small bathrooms to entire additions and whole house renovations. In 2009, the Magleby Remodel Group was named as the top remodeler in the state of Utah by Remodeler Magazine. Over the years, Magleby has become the market leader and local voice of authority in green building and building science. Magleby has completed the first two homes in the state of Utah that have qualified for certification under the new NAHB National Green Building Program. This effort earned Magleby Construction the title of Thermwise Builder of the Year in 2009. In his spare time, Magleby enjoys an occasional motorcycle ride and spending time with his wife, Kathy, their four sons, and 12 grandchildren. Let's give a round of applause to today's speaker, Paul Magleby. Well, he just gave my whole speech, so is there any questions? Um, who's heard of Magleby Construction here? By a show of hands, really. Okay, who's, who can tell me all the bad stuff that they've heard about us? Anybody up there want to uh, volunteer any information? How about some, some good things? Anybody heard some good things about us? Well, um, truly, he uh, went over quite a few of the, the facts that I was going to kind of intro with. He did mention, uh, you know, an award that we got in... Um, 2007, which was the National Custom Home Builder of the Year Award, uh, presented by the National Association of Home Builders. Now, just a little background on some of these awards that uh, different companies get, and this could be architects, who knows, uh, uh, people that manufacture and install paver bricks, whatever it is, you know, at least from the construction industry. Most of these awards are given by uh, publications and the reason they dream up a way to make an award is so that they can sell more magazines well the interesting thing about the, the particular award that we were uh, presented in uh, 2007 was it wasn't by a publication it was by the National Association of Home Builders it was a, a, a group of peers custom home builders that had gotten together and said, we need to begin to honor our own somehow. And um, they uh, created this award. Now, what was even, what's even more interesting about the award is that uh, typically on, when an award is given, it's something that uh, perhaps the owner sits down, he fills out a, uh, an application or a form, sends it in and, and uh, something that you know, he's seeking some kind of a, uh, an honor. Um, the award that I got uh, for the company was 
totally, I was totally unaware of what was going on. Uh, a builder acquaintance of mine in Salt Lake um, took it upon himself to uh, fill out the application and submit it. And then when uh, we were selected, uh, my, uh, my wife and one of my sons, who is now the president of the company, Chad, uh, took it upon themselves to provide the information to create a little um, uh, video clip that was presented. Uh, these, this was typ typically uh, in, in the uh, early days, there were symposiums that we would go to as custom home builders. In other words, groups of home builders from all across the country would um, meet together in this particular year, it was in Las Vegas, and um, various instructional opportunities, uh, networking, which has always been important to me. Um, and, um, and then this award presentation was gonna be given that evening at a dinner. And um, so we went to the dinner, had our, had our meal. I had two employees, Chad and another employee was there and and then this builder friend of mine from Salt Lake happened to be sitting at the table. It was an eight, eight, eight person round. And uh, the chairwoman of the, of the custom home builder committee at NAHB got up to begin the presentation. And she said, our, and this, by the way, this was the very first presentation of a custom home builder award by the association. And she says that this is our first recipient and the recipient is uh, from Utah. And I thought, who in the hell could be from Utah that would be getting this award? This is how <laughs> in the dark I was, and it's, um, it always touches me that, that, um, that this would all happen, you know, uh, unbeknownst to me, because I usually know everything that's going on. And, uh, and I'd gotten really comfortable, relaxed, slipped my shoes off, didn't wear my tie uh, to, the, to the meal, and uh, she says the first recipient is Paul Magleby from uh, Linden, Utah. Um, I'd like to run that video clip right now so you can see, uh, uh, it's 40 minutes, no, no, four minutes. Uh, and um, so this will give you a little idea now, be aware that uh, as people age, they look different from when they're younger. And uh, I do look a little different in this video. So if you'd run that now quick. the founder and president of Utah's Paul Magleby Companies. He has been building custom homes since 1974, when he graduated from Brigham Young University with a degree in construction management. Paul's team built six to 10 custom homes each year, ranging in budget from $1 million to $15 million. Known for his visionary business sense, Paul established his own excavation division and custom cabinet and wood shop. This special attention gives each Magleby client personal features that are unique to their home. And Paul insists all of his houses incorporate the latest building science philosophies and meet the standards to achieve a five-star energy rating. Clients come to Magleby companies based on Paul's reputation and their personal referrals. They say Paul's deep involvement, unparalleled construction knowledge, transparent budget process, and consistent on-time delivery would make them a repeat customer. But Paul doesn't just construct houses, he builds relationships. Paul recognizes that his employees are an extension of himself. He established a profit-sharing program for his company and during one rare, economically challenging business year, 
Paul contributed his own finances into Magleby Companies to avoid any downsizing. Paul epitomizes the word mentor. He fosters friendships, secures professional opportunities, and invites frank and encouraging discussions with builders and vendors at all levels. Every year he speaks with the students of the Brigham Young University Construction Management Program. He's also active and well-respected in the local Utah Valley Home Builders Association, of which he's been a member for nearly 30 years. When a controversial issue comes before the HBA, the first thing people want to know is, what does Paul think? Among his many accolades, Paul was named Builder of the Year in 2000 by the UVHBA. His Parade of Homes designs have also been awarded many first place honors. Paul has served on the Board of Directors of the National Association of Home Builders. He is also the first NAHB member from Utah to financially support BuildPack with a substantial gift. While his lifelong passion is custom home building, the love of his life is Kathy, his wife of 34 years. They have four sons and five grandchildren. Outside the office, Paul is active in his church, with the Boy Scouts of America, and with Habitat for Humanity. His company and his character lend themselves to quality, professionalism, honesty, and integrity, virtues that can't be bought, but rather earned over decades of service. The NEHB Custom Home Builders Committee and Drive It Systems Incorporated is proud to recognize Paul Magleby as our 2006 NEHB Custom Home Builder of the Year. Congratulations, Paul. Well, needless to say, I was shocked. And um, slight update, I have 12 grandchildren now. Um, but the repercussions of getting an award like this, I can't even uh, tell you how far-reaching it is. Because the minute that happened, there was a press release. And I'm telling you, it was all over the country. And so uh, Chad, my son being uh, the marketing guru that he is, you know, capitalized on that. And it kind of was a springboard for lots and lots and lots of opportunities that we've had since. Um, you know, how did, how did I get to that point? Frankly, I don't know. I honestly don't know. You're business students. I'm sure <laughs> in your uh, classes, your professors tell you to sit down, map out your, uh, your goals for a year, three years, five years, 10 years. That's nothing I ever did. I think uh, my, my whole uh, strategy was, uh, could be summed up in happenstance, you know, one word, or, and opportunity. Because truly, I, I just live day to day. I, my, whole, uh, my whole being, uh, heart and mind, was about doing a good job, uh, providing quality product to our clients and being honest and fair with them. You know, truly, I grew up in an era, and you probably never even heard of it, but there was, you know, it was always talked about the golden rule. You know, if you want to be treated a certain way, you treat other people that way. Uh, you don't try to take advantage of them. You don't try to uh, one-up them in any way. You treat others as you'd like to be treated. And that was always my, the way I <coughs> approached business and everything else in life. So I, ha I had no idea I wanted to go into the construction business, but uh, frankly, it's been one of the most rewarding uh, professions that I could possibly have chosen. Um, I'm uh, left-handed, dyslexic, I don't get theoretical things really well, but I can see how something needs to go together. I can visualize that from two dimension to three dimension, and uh, a lot of people can't do that. And, and as far as, you know, and, and to be able to look into the future to see where I want to get to with a project or an idea. I can do that. And so 
literally starting with nothing in 1974 is when I graduated from the other university in construction management. And about two weeks before that, I took my contractor's license test. Um, after having uh, been out of the country for a couple of years and returning in 1971, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And uh, circumstances forced me uh, up to BYU. I had to get a certain number of credit hours in a short amount of time in order to reinstate a student deferment I had that kept me from going to Vietnam. And, um, and I uh, had to get a job that summer to, to uh, because uh, I was going to summer school, I couldn't go back to California where my folks lived. So I stayed here and I got a job working for a contractor who was building a chapel down on Grandview Hill and just loved it. And uh, found out that the university had a program, construction management program, and, and it was truly in its infancy and, and then started probably in about 1968 or 69. I was in the third, third graduating class and there were nine of us in that class. And so uh, I found a profession, you know, did I sit down and know what I was gonna do in life? Absolutely not. Uh, the gentleman that I'd been working for uh, and was a superintendent, we were building, I was building a chapel for him in Pleasant Grove. Um, you know, uh, your professors tell you, hey, you got this degree, you can go out and get a great job. At least mine did. And, uh, you know, I got my, I graduated and I says, hey, Maurice, look, I got, I'm a, I got a bachelor's degree. I should, I should be worth more money. Well, he was kind of a different fellow and uh, didn't mean anything to him. So I just went, went away. I had a, a, an individual, one of my classmates that was a framing subcontractor, was working for a developer building homes. And he said, I'll pay you $5 an hour if you want to just be on the framing crew. And uh, my boss was paying me three twenty-five an hour. Uh, so uh, it was an economic thing to me. And I had two kids at the time, worked my way through school. Uh, no, uh, no student loans, anything else. You know, it was just uh, how do I get through here and get to a point that's uh, a goal in my life here in the short term. So I went to work for, uh, for Floyd and uh, just on the framing crew and, and an opportunity presented itself. The developer we were working for um, allowed me to subordinate a lot, a building lot in his subdivision, which means I don't have any money, but he will give me the deed to that piece of property and I'll take it over here to the bank and I'll give it to the bank and they'll give me a loan to build a house. And, uh, and I'll go take that loan and I'll go over here and I'll build the house and I'll sell it. You know, speculation. I mean, talk about gambling. Um, you know, this was, it's truly gambling to build speculative housing. But I didn't know any better and I wasn't too afraid of it because the houses seemed to be selling. And I sold my first house and got a little bit of capital and lo and behold, Mr. Benson, who was the developer, <clears throat> allowed me to do it again. And I did it again. And uh, the third time, I was building a house for myself and my family. And uh, a gentleman that uh, lived down the street, he and his wife, I was working on the house one night and they came walking up the street and um, approached me and said, we, we just sold our house. Would you consider possibly selling us this house? I said, I don't know. I'll go home and ask my wife. Uh, she was too busy raising two boys. We had one in in uh, 73 and one in 74. They were 13 months apart and she was busy being a mom and I don't think she knew much about anything else except taking care of those first two boys. 
And um, so I sold that house, went around the corner and did it again. And uh, that house we actually did move into for one year. And I sold that one and then moved across the field uh, into a house that we lived 13 years in. And my wife didn't uh, come from a real stable family. Uh, she uh, was a convert to the LDS church at about 16 years old. And so she needed stability in her life. And typically in uh, builders would, you know, at least my peers would build and sell every two or three or four years. I didn't do that. I just, we stayed where we were and she had the stability she needed. But, you know, we're, from there, um, s something interesting happened. We, uh, you know, we, I got a lot of skills, a lot of talents, a lot of abilities. I mean, I was literally a carpenter. I had my tool belt on every day. That was where I was the most comfortable. I was creating things with my hands. And I'm, and I, uh, um, something happened here. Previous, well, at that point in time, there were two major employers here in the valley. One was Geneva Steel, and one was the other university. So if you had a job at any one of those places, you had a fairly decent job. Uh, but they weren't big money-making jobs, and there wasn't a lot of money in this valley, really. But somebody, a couple of professor and his graduate student, developed a little program that uh, managed words called Word Perfect. And from that time forward, there was an influx of money here that, that uh, was very interesting to watch. And I had the good fortune to be involved in building Mr. Ashton's home, Mr. Bastion's home, uh, another home for Mr. Ashton up at Sundance. In fact, that was that timber frame home you saw in the video was uh, Ashton's Lodge. And, and it was um, when they approached me to build this home and they said it was going to be a timber frame structure, I had no clue what timber frame was, what it meant, how it went together. You know, the, a home or a building is just a big puzzle and you have to figure out how to put the pieces of the puzzle together in a, in a proper sequence. So that's all construction management is and business for that, for that matter is you gotta learn the sequence, you gotta get comfortable with that sequence and you develop your talents around those that knowledge that you get and the experience that you have. And so we had an opportunity to build a 16,000 square foot timber frame structure that was at the time the largest that we know of in, the North, in North America. And it was our first opportunity out the gate. So it was a learning curve for us, but we, uh, the gentleman that was in the video is, was our uh, site manager there at the time and he's been with me for 34 years now. And uh, I have another site manager that's still a site manager, has been with me 35 years. How, how do, why would people stay with, some, with a firm that long? There's gotta be a reason and that's part of the reason we got the award, I think. I always tried to be fair with our employees. I tried to treat them like I wasn't treated when I was working for a contractor. And uh, some of the things I saw him do that were truly unethical uh, and was hard for me to stomach. Um, I wasn't gonna do that and I wasn't gonna treat my employees the way he treated his employees. So even if it's bad, whatever employment you're in, you can learn something there of value. You can, in, that can be, become intrinsic to you and you can say, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do the opposite or something different when I'm in charge. So, um, you know, we, we just keep, kept having opportunities to do those things that were uh, extremely unusual, out of the norm, um, 
what, what we found as time went on that a lot of our residential clients became commercial clients as well. And so have any of you been to Thanksgiving Point? We had the opportunity to build the two main structures there, the, the Emporium and the restaurant and the water tower. Um, you know, that's not something we sought after or I sat down and made a goal to do something. It was a previous client that we'd done a good job for, that we'd treated fair and honestly, and they had a, held us in high esteem and they needed help. So they called on us. And away we go on another adventure. And, uh, and, it did, and an adventure it was because we'd never done commercial work like that. My heavens, there's, there was, um, as I recall, there's 70 some thousand square feet of commercial space there and in a totally different construction method that we, than we'd ever been used to doing. And so we had another opportunity to learn and grow. Well, you know, in the early days, I was, it was me and, and, and there's a, uh, well, there's Todd and Richard and Kelly and I. There's four of us and we all still work together. And, uh, you know, my payroll was, you know, two or $3,000 every two weeks. And, and uh, you know, it was manageable. I was, it was, I was wearing all the hats in the company. Uh, you know, I was the salesman, I was the accountant, the bookkeeper, I was the, I was the labor in, in, in a startup company or a, a young company, you become, you wear all the hats. And then as you grow, you, you begin to have to deal with different challenges. And um, that's uh, why I would encourage you as you go out into the, into the business world, that you seek out some, some uh, forum where you can increase your talents and abilities and become a better contributor to your employer or to yourself if you're in business for yourself or maybe in the future you're going to be in the business for yourself. Because those, those interactions that I had, um, I joined the National Association of Home Builders, the local uh, HBA in 1978 probably longer ago than most of you are old. And um, I don't know why I joined. Another builder probably just said, hey, you need to be part of this group. And probably for five years, I had no idea why I was there. They had a lunch every month and I'd go sit in the lunch and they'd have a guest speaker and, and there was something there to learn. But as I began to go to conventions, uh, International Builder Show is what they're called, and there'll be that show is going to be in Las Vegas this year in January. But they have an opportunity there to uh, educational tracks where you can increase, you know, your knowledge about your business on in various different aspects. And I was always about learning more. I needed to learn more. I felt inadequate. I didn't know how to do some of the things that kept cropping up again, you know, uh, challenges and problems that I needed to deal with. For example, you know, as, as you grow a business and you begin to uh, generate more revenue, you know, I had to have, I felt like I needed to have an accounting system so that I could, um, manage the money better. You know, of course, I wasn't all that adept at doing that, so I had somebody come in part-time and, and uh, after I bought the accounting system at one of the International Builder Shows uh, that I attended, and um, that, that was a, a growth issue that I had to deal with. The next thing as we continued to grow is we had um, more employees than the four of us, five of us. I had to deal with employee issues that I'd never had to deal with before. I wasn't trained to do that. I didn't have a human resource class that I could go to that, that helped me understand that. So I had, I relied or I leaned on 
the Home Builders Association and those opportunities, those educational opportunities, symposiums and seminars and conventions that I could go to to learn more. And, and, um, and that's that, um, what you'll find out in business, particularly if you're in your own business and you're in a startup, you'll grow and grow and grow and then you'll kind of reach a plateau. And, and at that plateau, you have an opportunity to make, you, well, you'll be forced into making some changes in the way you've thought about doing business, the way you're doing business, or else if you don't make a change because of the growth, you're gonna start to, to taper off. And your, uh, either your ability to perform, uh, to garner work, whatever it is. But if you make some changes there, then you'll, you'll uh, prepare yourself for the next growth spurt. And that's what I, I uh, continue to discover in the, in the company. Um, today we have a, about 100 employees. We have nine different companies that we manage, uh, that my son manages. Uh, two years ago in, in, December, in January, I kind of, you know, we're riding in the buckboard together. I'm driving. I says, okay, Chad, it's your turn to drive. I'm going to just sit back and relax and enjoy the scenery a little bit. Not that I didn't go to work or anything. I was still there because I want to make sure that he's capable of driving the buckboard. And uh, he's done an excellent job. He's, like most of you, uh, are full of vigor and vim and youth and energy. You know, that you want to get to the top of Tempanogos on the trail, either the front one or the back one. I'm, I'm comfortable now sitting down and watching you in the binoculars. I don't care to go up there. Uh, I, like this, I like the scenery from down below, and I don't have the energy to, to keep up with you. That's why we, we've, got a whole, we've got a great group of young men and women that, that are part of our staff now, and, and our culture uh, attracts great people. And um, um, and how do you generate a culture that attracts people? I don't know. Again, I think part of it's here. Part of it's here. Some of you probably work for somebody that's a jerk. I have. And. Uh, Maybe, hopefully you've learned from that experience. You don't want to be that kind of a person when you're in charge or when you have management responsibilities. Uh, at one of these conventions I went to in early 90s, and it happened to be in Las Vegas again, um, and, and my goal always was they have a little catalog that had all of the, all of the programs in it, who was teaching and what the, what the subject was. And uh, before the convention ever opened, I'd sneak in, I'd go get one of those little catalogs, and then that night I'd go through that thing <laughs> page by page. I'd dog ear the page and mark the classes that I thought would be of interest to me or of benefit because, again, I go because I'm lacking over here in the business some knowledge or, or some direction, and I need a little bit of help. That was my way of getting it, finding it. And, uh, and, it, and by happenstance, um, that it, in, at that one particular convention, there was a, uh, one of the th seminar subject topics was Deming and the Quality Builder. Well, I was, thought I was a quality builder but I had no idea what a Deming was. Anybody know who William Edwards Deming is? By a raise of hands. If you don't know who William Edwards Deming is, that's your next assignment. You go find out. Because when I found out <coughs> Deming has 14 management principles that he, he espoused, and he was, um, he was a statistician, and he, he and a guy named William Seward were uh, 
statisticians. Seward worked for Bell Laboratories. This was in, in the 40s. And uh, what happened on December 7th, 1941? Okay. Does it ever interest, have you ever thought about how in the world did a country who was not prepared to go to war became capable of winning a war in a short period of time? I mean, you, they built factories, they built ammunition, they built airplanes, they built all kinds of armaments, armaments in, in a short amount of time that was, that, and it had to be safe and it had to be high, high quality. We couldn't put our, our soldiers out there in, uh, in peril. <clears throat> in peril. They, needed to be, they need to function, they need to be safe. How did that happen? Well, Deming and a few guys they knew how to make quality products. They knew the processes. And they went and they set these factories up. And of course, we won the war. And then everybody forgot about Deming. Except in 1950, well, what happened at the end of the war? What ended the war in Japan? Kind of dropped a couple of bombs, didn't they? Well, the U.S. was in control now of that country. They wanted to know what the result of the devastation was and what the population was and what they needed to do. I mean, they needed to have a census. So they sent Deming to, to Japan and uh, random sampling is, is a result of what, and uh, you know, the polling data and things today that you see is simple is a result of some of the work that he did. Well, he fell in love with the Japanese people. And uh, he was invited to uh, speak to ja the Society of Japanese Engineers. And who in here is old enough, Dean? When you got something uh, made in Japan when you were young, what'd you think? Yeah, I, I was like, I hope it lasts a day before it breaks. Well, you buy stuff made in Japan today, don't you? What do you think? Good stuff. Good stuff, isn't it? Why? Well, it's because of Deming. William Edwards Deming told the, these engineers, he says, if you want to produce high quality products, if you'll follow these steps in five years, you'll be your products will be sought after in the world. It only took three years. Uh, you know, the, the Baldridge Award for quality that's awarded today in America, any of you are familiar with that? It's the Deming Award in Japan. And, and the reason they build high quality products is because of what he taught and, and espoused. Well, here I am, a, co a contractor, and I, I go sit in this seminar, and he's got the, the presenter uh, goes through these 14 points. And I'm like, I do that. I do that. I do that. There were, of the 14, I did nine or 10 of them intuitively. But those things um, create if you, if the company follows those principles, um, and they're not rocket science, they're just, you know, uh, treat others, it's basically the golden rule. Um, as I came back and I began to implement those principles in the business uh, a little more, you know, and, and allowed the employees and the to understand what it was. The, the important thing about those were, you know, I did them intuitively, but I really didn't understand why I should be doing them. And the presenter and Deming explained why you should be doing these things. And now it makes total sense to me. I understand the light bulb went on, if you will. And so um, 
that became a basis for, for how the philosophy that we operate under at Magleby Construction. And uh, I have to tell you that it's, that it's really hard when you hire somebody from outside. You know, um, we've just had a few employees come from a couple of the uh, big four general contractors in Salt Lake. They're coming into a culture that they don't understand. It's, it's, it's foreign to them. You know, we treat each other differently. We look at everything as a team. We're not clawing each other's back trying to get, you know, above the next guy. He's on our team. How can we, what can we do to make his job better? Here's our trade contractor. Our site managers, their only goal well, their main goal is to get that structure built. But a side goal for them is when they call their trade contractor to come in to do their work, is everything in place? Is there any hindrance? Is there any restriction that's going to keep that trade contractor from being able to get in there, do his work the most effectively, and then leave as fast as possible? Why would you want to do that? Well, one reason is our trade contractors give us a better price than everybody else out there. We let them know three weeks ahead of time when the day that they're expected on the job. They can plan their schedule from the information we give to them. When, when uh, my, one of my peers calls, them the night calls the plumber the night before and says, oh, I got an emergency, I've got to have you on my job in the morning, they say, well, hey, sorry, Magleby's have had a schedule for three weeks. You'll have to just wait. We get priority preference and uh, preference in pricing and preference in, in scheduling because of the way we treat our trade contractors and our vendors, people that sell us materials. We pay them on time. We don't string it out. So there's a whole lot of principles in the way we um, run our business that you know, that allow us to be very successful. And because we can produce, uh, you know, we, we know how long it takes to build a house. We, we schedule that house or whatever this project is, you know, and uh, we've got our little rule of thumb now because we see, we track that here. We're going back to statistical analysis, to so to speak. We can track we can tell a client that if it's a 6,000 square foot house here in the valley, our rule of thumb is 1,000 square foot per month. So in six or seven months, depending on how fast you, Mr. Client, make your decisions, we can, we can create that structure. Well, they go over here to Builder B, and the Builder B says, well, that'll be a 10 or 12 month project probably. Why? Because they're not organized, they're not, they don't do a schedule, they don't. So if you're a client and you want something constructed, would you rather have it done in six or seven months or would you rather have it done in 10 or 12 months? It's money to you. It's, it's uh, particularly if it's a business, it's like I can be in there three months ahead of time or four I can start selling my product. I can be, you know, uh, generating revenue. Maybe we ought to look at these guys. They're a little bit more. And I'll tell you that if, it, if we have anything negative about us, from, at least from anything I've ever heard, it's, oh, Magleby's are too expensive. You don't want to go there. Who's saying that? It's our peers. It's our competition. They don't have anything, there's nothing else bad that they can say about us. Except that we're too expensive, so Mr. Customer, you need to come over and let us do your job for you. They're too expensive. Well, the astute customer, if they sit down and analyze it, what they'll understand is that we've generated a shopping list We've gone down the aisles at the store. We've put everything in that cart. And there's more in our cart than there is in their cart. 
And that's why it's more money. The people that have a bottom line mentality, they, they gravitate to the lowest cost and that's, and then frankly, and I can't tell you how many of them have come back and say, oh, we just, we wished we would have gone with you. It took longer than they said. It cost us as much as you told us. The quality is poor. Uh, hope, am I getting running out of time? I knew I'd do this. Well, I, I appreciate being able to come and talk to you. Um, if there are some questions, um, have at it. You only got a couple minutes, sounds like. <clears throat> uh, I guess it's not necessarily about your company, but are you related to the Magglebees that own the restaurant? I wished I had a dollar for everybody that asked me that. <laughs> because I'd be retired and you wouldn't be listening to me today. Another question is, are let you me, related? Let me tell you, oh, sorry. Let me tell you the answer to that. Magleby's restaurant was started several years ago, like 20 or more, 25 maybe. And one of my cousins was one of the original 10 or so guys that went uh. together to start the restaurant. And they <laughs> chose Magleby's as the name. The current owner is Doc Parkinson. And they probably didn't want to name it Parkinson's Restaurant for some reason. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Did you want to ask a question? No. Did, did you have another question? One more right here. Uh, you said you build your houses to a five-star energy rating? Yes. Like all your houses? Yes. I'm just curious, uh, curious what some of those building practices are. I don't know much about eco-friendly homes or well, how that works. it's about okay. energy efficiency. You go buy your computer, your washing machine, or your toaster, or whatever it is, if it's got an Energy Star label on it, right. the government standard that they've built that product to uh, uh, says that it's going to consume less energy than a, com a competing item. And so when we build our homes, we've got that standard. that we, It's an Energy Star standard. It's energy efficient windows, it's energy efficient, that thermal blanket that we put around the house is, is more energy efficient. Uh, uh, lighting, now lighting is gonna be LED and, and, and uh, an energy efficient lighting package. Water resource, it consumes less water. Uh, orientation, uh, so that we don't get as much heat gain on the house from, from radiant uh, energy. Uh, and weather, uh, conserv conservation of, if we're building in the forest, it's not, we're going in there and cutting down all the trees, we're, we're cutting down the trees that just have to be gone, we leave everything else, right. whole bunches of stuff like that. That cool. answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Good question. I think if you have some additional questions you want to ask Paul after, we can, uh, he'll be here for a few minutes. If you want to join us for lunch, I think we might still have a few spots left. So let's give Paul Magleby a round of applause. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. We have